now that we've covered some basics of air pressure and winds, we now focus even more on some atmospheric circulation as well as I move into talking about oceanic at, uh, circulation patterns uh, as well. And so because we're going to be looking at a lot of flowing and movement for uh, our images, some of what we'll see here as an example in the background of this showing uh, a map showing that the Gulf Stream and its temperatures distribute a lot of, of energy from the lower latitudes, kind of the tropics and subtropics, up into very high latitudes um, through in this uh, kind of circulation pattern of the ocean are a fitting song for uh, this video to help us get in the mood to talk about this topic is Even Flow by Pearl Jam. So we're going to note here that I'm going showing from this first example, which I just talked about this kind of distribution of energy being moved around a little bit, at least just kind of how we do air pressure and, and kind of from that winds move uh, air around and note that again we just had kind of this pressure gradient force you know if we just had this hypothetical circulation if the earth didn't rotate and we'd have something like on the left hand side but again as we kind of as we noted in a prior lecture it's you know, to show that you know, in note that um, because we have to take into account rotating the earth like for example on the right here and um, we actually then um, end up having a series of cells that we're going to be looking at uh, as we can turn them and we're going to have kind of this rotation around um, and kind of in, uh, and going up and down and round and round. Um, so uh, I noted those on the prior slide. Um, I, I gave specific names to them. So if, just to back up here, so we have the Hadley cell, the Farrell cell, and the Polar cell. Um, sometimes you also hear that um, referred to as the Hadley cell, um, which is in the tropics, the mid-latitude cell, and then the Polar cell, the mid-latitude cell uh, being the Farrell cell, the last one, and uh, but then the Polar cell. Again, pretty self-explanatory there. But again, the idea here where we're seeing again these kind of circulation cells, and we'll look at this more with the Hadley cell on the next slide, um, kind of three of them occurring, one within kind of the tropics up to the subtropics. Um, so we'll turn about from uh, the equator to uh, 25 to 30 degrees, uh, both north and south latitude, and one that's mid latitude. So from again that starting point about 25, 30 north or south uh, up to about 50 to 60 degrees north or south um, is, is where our mid latitude cells are and then the polar cells really being that remainder of about 50 60 uh, depending 60 degrees basically and uh, up to 90 degrees whether that's again north or south and we're going to have this kind of circulation patterns of, of low pressure and high pressure around um, where we have uh, kind of this low pressure converging at the airs um, of air at the earth's surface that air rising and kind of conversely air pressure uh, excuse me high pressure and where we have convergence of air aloft and that descending uh, to the Earth's surface. And so we can see this, for example, with this Hadley cell cross section. Um, so now if we're kind of looking at it now from the side instead of top, more top down. Um, so in the, in the Hadley cells again are in what we would term the tropics um, and, and uh, end up creating what we term the intertropical convergence zone, this is where we have the, again this inner, uh, um, this convergence of air. Again, that's where we get that low pressure. Or, you know, it's really just naming that low pressure that convergence zone it's where that air converges and then ends up rising as we can see roughly um, around the equator although as we'll see that shift seasonally um, and so that then um, air rising ends up um, as we'll see in future lectures as well with precipitation is causing a lot of our air to cool a lot of moisture that may be held on that to precipitate out and that air kind of rotates around and once it's higher up in altitude, um, as we can see here, and cools, eventually then descending, again, at about 25 to 30, uh, 25 to 30 degrees north and south latitudes, as we can see here. Um, and so we, those are our high pressure, or we know what we term the subtropical high pressure uh, areas. And so again, we kind of go around and around in these cells as we term them here. So again, once again, just noting where those high and low pressure areas are. So again, I noted this intertropical convergence zone. This is where, again, we kind of, it is roughly at the equator, although as, as this image shows us, it actually varies uh, throughout the year. Um, and so we kind of have these two extremes, the January intertropical convergence zone on the bottom in blue, July intertropical convergence zone in red on the top. And again, we, we, it tracks between these areas, of course, between those months. Um, and, you know, and really, you know, to note that this is 
you know, generally following where our sun is overhead, uh, directly overhead. So it's roughly following um, where our, you know, that subsolar point or where the sun is directly overhead, uh, perpendicular to Earth's surface um, for, at noontime on any given day of the year. And then we've tracked you know, where that occurs somewhere between 0 to 23.5 degrees, either north or south, again, of course, throughout the year. And you can go back and review that. Um, but again, just to note that this is really um, occurring roughly within those latitudes. Although also to note that this can occur at higher latitudes, um, even than that, up to about 30, low 30s um, degrees, around 30 degrees, either north or south. And, and the most prominent examples we'll look at in this next slide is the example here where we actually um, end up having this occur over into the 30s degrees latitudes occurring over much of South Asia, so countries like India as well as East Asia, um, so countries like China. And so um, that occurring because of this difference again of a land water heating difference where you know, that land heats up a lot quicker than the water around it. And in this case, um, as we see, you can actually see within this next slide, um, this leads to a very famous, relatively famous weather Kind of phenomenon or seasonal phenomenon uh, that we observe that is known as the monsoons um, and really the monsoons are uh, known as we as we end up seeing in this example for the precipitation that they bring in the summer months um, the name monsoon actually just simply means a change in wind direction because we have to back up and, and kind of move uh, and look at the slide again you know we can note that when the intertribal convergence zone in its July pattern, or it's roughly summer pattern, um, where it's occurring again, that is a convergence zone. That means that is where the low pressure is. And remember, with our low pressure, that air at the air, at their surface has been moving into that area um, and, and, and then rising. And note again, then really where the area that's going to be coming from is going to be coming off of this very warm ocean just to the south of it here and moving into it again as that air rises, as we'll come to see. Um, ends up then causing a lot of precipitation, as what we were observing in that slide uh, one forward. But again, in, and then in reverse, um, you know, in the more winter months for this area, now our intertribal convergence zone has shifted off of the land to the south and is now out over the ocean. So now our change of wind is actually moving again towards this off of off of the land surface. The relatively colder, drier winds moving off of our, our land surface because again, there's not really Real, any real moisture there um, to um, be coming off of that compared to the oceans. So that's again the monsoons again once it just run through this once more um, we can see here now in the summer months you see that precipitation occurring uh, that, that's kind of what, what's appearing here but here it comes again boom um, showing those summer months um, but again the, the monsoon name itself simply just means that change in wind direction of course in this specific example we get a lot of precipitation occurring then in the summer months. And we actually have some, what of a similar phenomenon that actually does occur in, in, a part, in parts of the southwest United States as well. Not as strong of a monsoon uh, bringing lots of precipitation as it does here, but still enough of an effect where there can be kind of seasonal storms much more likely uh, in some areas of the southwest because of this. And so just to show this once again kind of a full extent um, from the equator on the right here up to the North Pole. Um, so we're just showing one half of the Earth, but you know, essentially thinking of it much the same way uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. But to show that I have some examples here, and again, the Hadley cell, the Farrell cell, and the Polar cell here. Um, and just to also note, as we'll come to talk about more in the future, on um, these subtropical uh, and polar jet streams that also are important for weather patterns. Um, and we, we'll cover that a little bit more when we talk about weather. So to review as well, um, we've talked about uh, air pressure, we've talked about how that affects surface winds, and so we can look through, the, you watch through this GIF, um, again from the climbthis.org website, you'll be using this more um, as well, I'm looking at this more uh, through lessons in, in the, this module. And so to note, you know, we can observe this, we can watch how patterns, broader scale patterns in this case, of high and low pressure occur over time, and so you know, I want you—I want you to go and, and want, kind of rewatch back through this um, at, at your leisure as well um, to make those observations of where we're seeing these high and low pressure areas. Do you know part areas that where it's more relatively static, where we're always seeing relatively high or low pressure, or are we seeing kind of seasonal shifts where um, parts of the year um, we're seeing 
um, places that become, say, much greater in low pressure, um, to, for example, to look for some of that, um, but also maybe then that disappears part of the year. And um, so again, you can watch through this, you can um, see this, and watch for that occurring in different locations. I want you to start making those observations yourself instead of me having to point them all out for you here. Um, but again, just those are some things that I want you to start looking for, um, for example, in this. And to note then, um, to bring it forward um, here, um, we're now shifting from atmospheric to oceanic circulation. Um, just to remember that um, when we make this shift, to note that oceans are actually another very important part, perhaps even more important part uh, than wind in this global energy distribution, um, because remember our water and its specific heat, um, because it can it, it takes a lot more energy for it to either warm up or cool off. Um, you know that energy can travel much longer distances as it's kind of, as, as ocean currents move around, and that warm water can be shifted um, to much uh, northerly or southerly latitudes from the equator um, to distribute that heat energy um, once it's kind of dissipated off. Um, from the water compared to winds, um, which, you know, their temperature generally would be changed much relatively more quickly, um, and, and that, with that heat would be lost much more quickly before it ever reaches those very high latitudes. And so, and we can observe on this map here, ocean gyres are these continuous loops of Earth ocean circulation. So we see some examples here, the North Atlantic gyre um, in the Atlantic Ocean, also the, the South Atlantic gyre, as, as the arrows are showing here. Similarly, the North uh, Pacific Gyre and the South Pacific Gyre as well, um, showing us trying to show some of their patterns and rotation patterns there. Um, and to note that, you know, okay, so you can see those ocean currents as, as in the arrows that are driving them. The question is, well, why do we observe this particular pattern? And hopefully you could at least see some of them that I was tracing there, and I'll do this again. So here's, again, an example of the pattern that we see in the North Atlantic. Here's the, exa here's the pattern we see in the North Pacific. Now the South uh, Atlantic and the South Pacific. And so if you watch carefully there and you see the you know, patterns I'm um, showing, you go, well, actually, that's interesting. You know, the North Atlantic, we seem to see one pattern or one you know, direction of rotation. And then the South Atlantic, we see another. And again, if, I want you to go back and watch this, but you can watch this one that with that previous GIF. Um, but part of really the reason we're seeing that pattern is, and this is matching anti-cyclonic wind patterns or uh, high pressure wind patterns, uh, wind directions of these high pressure cells. We can see that, I mean, again, um, also tied to what we note in that high pressure moves in a clockwise manner in the northern hemisphere and in a counterclockwise manner in the southern hemisphere is why we're seeing that change or kind of, you know, change in direction uh, depending on the hemisphere you're in. Um, again, so that tied once again uh, in part to that Coriolis force, those friction forces, as we talked about uh, prior with winds, not only uh, until, of course, plus that um, with the pressure gradient force. So you can just, you know, some zoomed in examples here, I mean, further, it's just a, a more detailed example showing the North uh, Pacific gyre as well, and kind of the many currents that are you know, tied with that. Um, but here, for example, off the western coast of the United States, we have the, the California current brings a lot of cooler um, moist water, though, um, to um, off of the western United States coast. And then in the Atlantic, similarly, um, we have, again, to note that when we started off, we looked at the Gulf Stream. We showed this a, a picture of the Gulf Stream to, show, uh, to start this lecture, um, and, and that being a very big energy distributor, uh, heat distributor across uh, the Earth in the sense of it brings a lot of very warm water um, from the relatively tropical regions. Um, within you know, the Gulf of Mexico and kind of, um, around the you know, Tropic of Cancer and in the tropics of the Atlantic and moves it north um, and brings all that into much colder areas. Um, and actually the reason why much of Europe uh, and the British Isles, for example, and even up to Iceland are a little bit more seasonably warm throughout, the really, really yearly, um, are a little bit warmer than otherwise they would be. Um, because of this massive amount of warm energy uh, through these ocean currents that are distributed up into the higher latitudes. And so you can just see that same uh, image more or less here um, that we started out with. Um, again, just to note that the Gulf Stream and other warm ocean currents are very important for this energy distribution from tropical latitudes to the polar latitudes. Much more important, um, especially from the tropics to polar latitudes, than winds are 
um, and winds acting more in local or kind of um, within smaller regional scales of that distribution. And so this then um, we end up seeing not only at uh, surface ocean currents as we've looked at with the past few slides, but also um, how this plays out in what we term the thermohaline circulation or this deep sea conveyor belt of oceanic movement. So not only uh, the oceanic movement being shown uh, of surface patterns, um, which is being shown in these by, by these red arrows and how these kind of move around, but also these um, once um, that water sinks as it does uh, with the Gulf uh, you know, current here, it's up in north latitudes, northern latitudes, and actually sinks very deep down in the ocean and then kind of tracks along these arrows as we can see them here. Um, deep within the ocean. And this is, whole system is driven by differences um, not only in temperature as, as part of this whole full name here, the thermal part being, being referring to temperature, but also in salinity or salt content. Uh, that's the haline part of this name. And so um, this again is important regional coastal influences in areas um, is really important. Um, and so I won't go too much more into detail that here, but it's another important process for us to take into account. Um, again, this tied to this um, kind of fluctuations and movements around of lots of ocean water and this conveyor belt pattern. Um, finally, um, as you start off your uh, module in this in this module, um, you had your pre-module question tied to uh, El Nino and La Nina. And um, so just to detail a little bit through that, uh, but I'm also going to put out part of that off on you and, and have you go and find a lot of information about this. But just to know, help us you know, understand what is it, uh, will El Nino or the Southern Oscillation, so sometimes what we term ENSO for short, it refers to a periodic change in the atmosphere and ocean um, circulation of the tropical Pacific region. So to note that the, this is when the ocean becomes unusually warm uh, sea surface temperatures uh, in the uh, eastern part of the Pacific, where uh, La Nina is kind of a hypernormal condition, um, where actually the ocean becomes even more unusually cold um, in, in parts of the, the Pacific uh, tropical region than it normally is. And so um, this not is important, you know, and why we want to talk about this is because it actually affects weather patterns on a global scale. It has many uh, weather pattern implications for the western United States and as I've actually asked you in your question I mean, so I'm going to have you be going out and looking for some of that and, and information of what ha occurs when we have an El Nino or La Nina. So um, you can show them, see a map here of this condition of El Nino where again we see a very in pronounced anomaly so what this map is actually showing us is an anomaly from kind of zero here in the middle and to the right these positive values meaning temp temperatures greater uh, you know, above average um, again anomaly from an average um, uh, calculated over time um, and then kind of these negative values being um, you know, we would see expect to see colder than expected average so essentially an El Nino condition and uh, being something where we have these much greater um, or positive values you know, much warmer conditions than average expect expectation. Um, and then La La Nina, we would expect to see quite a bit of colder than average temperatures. And so, again, just to speak through what um, is our kind of average or neutral conditions um, is, is tied to this, um, what another circulation pattern um, that we term the Walker circulation. And to note that really with kind of the normal pattern here that we end up seeing um, really through the Pacific, uh, where we end up having our winds in the Pacific moving generally from, uh, excuse me, in the tropical Pacific, I should say specifically, moving relatively from east to west um, and through over much of the Pacific. Um, and uh, so, so they move a lot of uh, that warm, moist air uh, to, over to areas um, like Indonesia, of Indonesia, and kind of the Pacific, I mean the tropical Pacific. Um, Western tropical Pacific Ocean, and that's where we get a lot of then um, a lot of converging air uh, uplift, and a lot of again, creation of clouds uh, within precipitation over here, and that's uh, end up having a relatively dry pattern uh, to some extent, more so off of the um, parts of uh, Western 
South America, particularly where we have this kind of equatorial or tropical area. And in part, that's, that's occurring because of a cold current that comes up off of um, uh, the, the higher latitudes of uh, South America as well. Uh, there is some precipitation there, but again, not as much relative to our then condition. Um, or actually, and shifting of this, this condition where then with El Nino, again, we have um, kind of this shifting of very warm waters that will pile up now on the um, uh, western part, again, of South America here in this equatorial region. So we end up kind of shifting around um, where we end up having now um, actually a lot of precipitation, a lot more moisture being brought to this regional area um, uh, compared to normal. And so we end up having, um, again, on that western part of South America, a lot more warmer temperatures, a lot more precipitation than is, is normal for that for normal type of conditions or neutral conditions and then kind of conversely because we've shifted that air kind of move it in this opposite direction now from west to east um, we end up having a, a much drier set of conditions for El Nino in that western Pacific where we're not you know, prior to that we were seeing a lot more precipitation so we can see a lot more wildfires a lot more drier conditions a lot more drought type of things occurring there because of this and then again for that last type of condition our La Nina um, again, it's, it's really just a hyper normal where because we have um, in really kind of colder than normal conditions within that eastern Pacific or again along the west coast of South America we end up then um, seeing kind of even um, to some extent drier type of conditions um, like a cold more continuing of that cold upwelling of water off of the uh, parts of high latitudes of South America um, but then really even increased storms, even more precipitation, usually this leads to a lot of flooding, um, lots of lots of precipitation in uh, places, again, like uh, Indonesia, uh, parts of Australia, um, and really you know, this Western Pacific region. So that's just a, a short detail on this, but again, uh, I want you to go out and, and learn more information on this. So here's a whole suite of links you can use and access um, that'll have good information uh, and more covering El Nino and La, Ni La Nina, and why it's so important for us. And again, this will you know tie to part of you also answering uh, that uh, post module question here, and focusing on some you know, specific impacts that uh, are occurring for the Western United States um, as well. So again, look into all this uh, so that it help you answer that question.